All right, everyone, good morning. Uh, my name is Scott Williams. I'm uh, part of the uh, Gold Standard Panel for the ISR. Uh, so uh, as I understand it, this is the uh, academic year 2019-2020 inaugural uh, fellow webinar. Uh, we're gonna focus primarily on introduction to scoring and then talk a little about the ISR interface. Uh, so most definitely, uh, as we go along, please uh, send questions. Uh, I believe there should be a text box uh, on your screens uh, to send questions to me. Uh, this will, uh, we wanna make it as interactive as possible because we're not entirely certain uh, your level of comfort with this. We're going to go with the assumption that most people haven't done a whole lot of polysomnographic scoring. Uh, and so it'll be fairly basic. We're gonna look at some of the rules in the scoring manual and uh, then apply them to uh, a certain epics within the ISR. If you've got any questions as we go along, if you want me to stop, rewind, go back uh, and look at things in a little more detail, uh, absolutely let me know. If you think I'm going too slowly and you uh, have more specific nuanced questions, uh, ask away uh, with those as well. So just to start with, my only conflict, if it's a conflict, is that I am a consultant for the ASM uh, doing the ISR, but this is all about the ISR, so it kind of fits. Uh, this is exactly what we're going to be talking about. We're going to look at some of the scoring rules, talk about the ISR, then uh, discuss a little bit about how the ISR works, the nuts and bolts of it, because I think a lot of you all in your labs are going to be using it for uh, some feedback as you get comfortable uh, learning how to do this scoring since we didn't really do much of it in med school or residency. This may be the first time that you've actually seen uh, all the squiggly lines. And then uh, talk about the CME test and then uh, use of the ISR as a learning aid. So just uh, to start off uh, in its most basic form, let's talk about the EEG frequencies. And they are termed using uh, you know, using the Greek names based off of the frequency uh, that you see. And the slowest waves that we have, called slow waves, frequency of one half to two hertz. And in order to qualify as slow wave activity, they have to have a minimum amplitude of 75 microvolts peak to peak, uh, usually in the frontal derivations. Uh, delta waves, are zero to 3.99 hertz, and you can see there's an overlap between the slow wave activity and delta waves. So delta waves encompass a larger frequency range than slow wave activity. Theta waves are four to 7.99 hertz. Alpha waves are eight to 13 hertz, and then beta waves are greater than 13 hertz. And this is good board fodder, so these are numbers certainly to memorize. And then, the uh, rapid eye movements, you can see here, they are defined by an initial deflection lasting less than half a second, whereas slow eye movements have an initial deflection usually greater than half a second. So you'll see that I'm going to switch between these PowerPoint slides and the ISR itself. So this is uh, the ISR interface. And just, uh, just to kind of orient you to this, you'll log in through uh, the, the ISR program. You'll each have your own individual account. And then you'll be able to score one 200 epic record every month. And you'll also have the ability to look at archived records if you wanted additional practice. There's some, uh, I'll, I'll orient you to the screen and then talk about some of the keys that you're gonna use uh, for the scoring uh, interface. Over here on the left-hand side, this is the EOG, so the right electrooculogram. This is the right eye, the left electrooculogram. So these two here are going to be what you're looking for in terms of rapid eye movements. Then we have three EEG leads. Frontal, F is for frontal, C is for central, O is occipital. And everything with an even number is the right side of the head. Everything with an odd number is the left side of the head. 
And so what this means is there's a lead on the right frontal lobe, and it's referenced to the left mastoid. And you can kind of, what I'd suggest you all do is go into the lab for a couple nights and just look at the technologists and see how they hook people up. That's kind of a talk in itself. Uh, but basically what we're looking at in terms of these squiggly lines is the electrical potential, the electrical difference between one area of, of the head and another. Um, and we use the mastoid as the reference because it's electrically neutral. And so that means that uh, any of these uh, waves that you see should be coming from uh, only the area that we're looking for. So we don't have, uh, we just have uh, frontal lobe reference to a bone. And so all of these electrical signals are coming from the electrical difference between the frontal lobe uh, and basically a ground uh, wire. Here's the chin EMG, uh, EKG, leg leads. So we have two leads, one on each of the anterior tibialis muscles. There's a snore microphone, CPAP flow. This is a, a CPAP titration study. And then chest and abdomen effort sensors. And then of course your pulse ox. And just switching screens here. This uh, is, if you go to the help menu, I just want to show you the different uh, buttons that you have to push on the ISR so that you know how to actually score it. We've got four different areas that we're scoring, staging, respiratory, limb movements, and arousals. For stage scoring, you can see the keyboard shortcuts here. For respiratory scoring, these are the keyboard shortcuts. And then limb movements and arousals, and then the epic navigation. Certainly don't expect you to remember all that, but just know that you can go into the help menu and take a look at keyboard shortcuts so that you know exactly uh, what to do when you start scoring these records. So to begin with, we always, knowing that we're coming into this record sometimes halfway through the record because it's only a 200 epic sample of a full record, you wanna know where your reference epic is. So uh, we give you what we call epic zero so that you know what stage you're in prior to the first epic. And the way to do that, you toggle between the 30 second view and a 120 second view by hitting the space bar. And when you toggle out to the 120 second view, you can see this epic zero, so that gives you the reference point. Now I'd recommend that when you score the ISR, you do it in two passes. The first pass should be in the 30 second view, and you go down here to edit montage, and then go to stage. And what that does is it gets rid of some of the other channels. Oh, got some technical glitches here. But just trust me when I say it does. And basically, it will allow you to uh, see the E channels a little more, a bit more easily. All right. And so, uh, when we're scoring, it's important to know exactly what the definitions are. And these are all from the scoring manual. Uh, the, score, the current scoring manual is version 2.5. And you can see here that all of these are referenced, uh, the page number of the scoring manual, as well as the section and the subsection numbers. So for scoring N1, and especially in those who don't generate an alpha rhythm, Apologies if you can hear a, a jet in the background. Uh, I've uh, got some uh, Navy jets flying overhead today. Uh, but uh, for those uh, who don't generate an alpha rhythm, you score N1 commencing with the earliest of any of the following. So slow eye movements, low amplitude mixed frequency, predominantly four to seven hertz, uh, or at least one hertz slower than stage W, 
or if you see vertex sharp waves. And these vertex sharp waves uh, are sharply contoured, less than half a second, and maximal uh, over the central region. For scoring N2, you transition from N1 to N2 if either or both of the following occurred during the first half of that epoch or the last half of the previous epoch. And these are what we call N2 defining features. And there's two of them. One is a K-complex, the other is a spindle. A K-complex is a well-delineated negative sharp wave immediately followed by a positive component. The total duration is greater than half a second, and these are maximal in the frontal derivations. A sleep spindle would be a train of distinct sinusoidal waves with a frequency of 11 to 16 hertz, with a duration of greater than half a second, maximal in the central derivations. So I wanted to show you exactly what I meant by the different montages. This is what it looks like with the full montage. And so you can see all of the different channels are appearing. And this is what happens when you see the staging montage and you can see that the EEG channels are much more clear. So when we look at For example, the first epic of this record, we can see that we've got some K-complexes and some spindles. And so this is clear at N2 sleep. In epic four, we have N2 sleep down here, and then some alpha activity, which is basically an arousal, and then the frequency decreases back to N1 sleep and then another arousal at the end. So we actually have two arousals in this epoch and overall a stage of N1 sleep. And here are some examples of spindles. Here we can see that this is a sinusoidal, approximately 12 hertz frequency. You can see that it starts fairly low amplitude, increases in amplitude, and then tapers off. And then a non-sinusoidal, 14 hertz, basically it initially starts and then is approximately the same amplitude and then tapers off. Again, all of these are maximal in the central derivation. And then I also wanted to show you a few examples of K-complexes. This is a classic K-complex right here. So uh, negative is actually at the top of the screen and positive is at the bottom, so it's a little bit backwards. But you have an initial negative sharp wave followed by a positive component, which is a bit slower. Stands out from the background EEG, total duration of greater than half a second, and these are usually maximal over the frontal derivation. Down here, these are what we call poorly formed K-complexes. We still have the negative sharp wave, but we have a positive, so from here to here, positive half wave before that, and it just doesn't look as classic as this reference picture. Here you have a slow, broad negative component, followed by a positive component. These are still K-complexes by the definition in the scoring manual, but they look a little bit like less classic. And here, this isn't really a K-complex because there's, it doesn't stand out from the background, and it's really indistinguishable from the preceding waves. So this is just a good example of classic, not so classic, but still meets criteria, and then doesn't meet criteria for a K-complex. The other thing to note about scoring is that for scoring N2, you would score a given epoch as N2 if the majority of the epoch meets criteria for N2. And practically what that means is that if an arousal occurs in the first half of an epoch and there are no key complexes or spindles until the second half of the epoch, it's N1. If there is a key complex or, or spindle in the first half of the epoch, 
then more than half of the epic meets criteria for N2. And then we end stage two if there's a transition to wake, N3, or stage R, or if there is an arousal followed by low amplitude mixed frequency EEG, in which case we would change it to N1, if there were a major body movement followed by slow eye movements and low amplitude mixed frequency EEG, or slow eye movements alone, but that would not be sufficient to end scoring of an N2. You have to have slow eye movements with the arousal. So I want to talk a little about EPIC uh, 138 here. Uh, this is N3 sleep. And so you can see that the difference between what I was just showing you and the N3 sleep, all of these are slow waves, everything that's marked here. They're very high amplitude, slower waves, again, half to two hertz. If you want to see where the isoelectric line is, sort of the zero crossing line, you push the F, F as in Frank, key, and that toggles this little blue line on and off. Hopefully you can see that. And then that'll give you a sense of where it crosses from negative to positive. And then basically you can measure the slow waves as a result. Now the ISR has the ability to tag events. You just double click, and then you can draw a box anywhere you want. And you can put whatever event you would like to in there. And then that'll save it on your particular scoring so that then you can compare that with others, with the faculty, with your reference standard in your lab, or uh, with the video when, uh, when you'll see uh, each month uh, as we do the ISR videos. Uh, we will tag these events, as you can see here, and you can see uh, how you compare to uh, what we've scored as the answer key. So a few notes about the scoring of N3. Again, the frequency is half to two hertz. The peak-to-peak -peak amplitude must be greater than 75 microvolts, measured over the frontal region, referenced to the contralateral mastoid, that's that M1, or if it was a left-sided electrode, it would be referenced to the right-sided mastoid, which is M2. You score N3 when there is greater than or equal to 20% of an epic that has slow wave activity. And that's basically six seconds out of the 30-second epic. So we do staging on 30-second epics. So 20% of that is six seconds. So if there's six seconds worth of slow wave activity, then the entire epic is scored as N3. N3 replaces an older terminology of stage three and stage four. Stage three and four were basically two distinct slow wave stages, but stage four had to have uh, a significant proportion, uh, usually half or greater uh, of the slow wave activity. Uh, but we've combined three and four now, and it's just N3, because it hasn't really been shown to have any uh, substantial physiologic significance. K-complexes are considered slow waves if they meet the definition of slow wave activity, and sleep spindles may persist in N3 sleep. So just because you see a spindle doesn't mean you have to call it N2. If it meets criteria for N3, then you call it N3. Eye movements are typically not seen during N3 sleep. You can see a little bit, but typically it's not significant. Any eye activity or any electrical uh, activity in the EOG leads is oftentimes just an artifact. And the chin EMG is often lower than in stage N2. And it may be as low as stage R sleep. So just some important things to note about the scoring of N3. So uh, kind of taking you back to physics a little bit, uh, looking, at, looking at waveforms. We have this top part over the isoelectric line 
This is the negative half wave and the positive half wave. And one way to measure a wave would be to look at the starting point crossing the isoelectric line, half wave, half wave, and this is the full component of the wave. Alternatively, you can score peak to peak. So same, same waveform. It's just that this is the now the negative half wave, and both this and this section are the positive half waves. Now what happens here though, and this is important for your scoring of the ISR, in order for us to be all on the same page, it's really important for you to know how we're scoring slow waves. If we have anything crossing the zero line, we will terminate the waveform at the zero line crossing. So let me explain that again. In this example, we have a peak and another peak, and between these two peaks, it only crosses the zero line to go up to this half wave and then go back down. There's no additional crossing of the zero line. In this example, we have it cross the zero line again and then go back down to this peak. For the scoring of the ISR, and I'd recommend that you all just start scoring the same way, you end the wave as soon as it crosses the zero line again. So this whole part doesn't count, and this is where it terminates. And this is important because sometimes you'll have 5.9 or 6.2 seconds of slow wave activity, and it can be kind of frustrating if you're not scoring it the same way that we are. Uh, so just know that these, this is the convention that we use. As soon as it crosses this, the zero line, that's where we terminate the waveform. Here, so this is the first peak, and then it goes here, doesn't cross here. If it did, we would terminate the waveform, but it doesn't. It goes all the way down to here. So peak to peak, that's one wave. Another peak to peak. And sometimes you have to zoom in to see whether it really does cross or not. Uh, your resolution is probably a bit difficult to tell. Uh, but this is one peak, this is the next peak. Peak to peak, peak to peak. And this is how we score the waves. As you're doing your first few records, I would encourage you to go at an excruciatingly slow pace and uh, really try to look at each individual waveform. It does take a lot longer than what your technologists are doing because they're scoring thousands of epics a day. But as, there's a jet again, so if you hear the background noise, my apologies. Uh, so as you're doing these first few uh, records especially, expect it to take a few hours to do each record. Uh, I remember when I was doing the first few, literally took all night just as we're sort of scrutinizing each waveform and the technologist sitting next to us saying, why are you looking at that so closely? You're going to make yourself go crazy. And it's just because we're trying to learn the right way. And then once you have a good... Uh, muscle memory, once you've got a good algorithm in your head, you can go much more quickly. But it's best to learn the right way the first time uh, so that you don't uh, get any bad habits. So let's go back to some other tips here. And then our last EEG morphology, uh, or our last uh, stage, is going to be stage R. Stage R, definite stage R is defined by low amplitude mixed frequency EEG, absence of K-complex or spindles, chin EMG no higher than during any other stage for the majority of the epic, and rapid eye movements at any position within the epic. This is from page 26 of the scoring manual. And you can score stage R in the absence of REMS. 
if all of the following are present. And these are just the things that you've just got to memorize. Low amplitude mixed frequency EEG, no K complexes or spindles, chin EMG no higher than during any other stage for the majority of the epic, just as the same we had for the definite stage R. There can't be any intervening arousal, no slow eye movements following an arousal or stage W. And this is from the scoring manual, the sample epics 60 through 63. We, we see here this EPIC-60 is scored as stage W. You've got high chin EMG, slow eye movement, but alpha activity. The presence of the alpha activity for the majority of the EPIC would score this as stage W. Slow eye movements without alpha activity with this low amplitude mixed frequency Low amplitude mixed frequency plus slow eye movements equals stage N1. And you can see the chin EMG is dropped off a little bit here too. Low amplitude mixed frequency, no slow eye movements, no alpha, low chin EMG, even though there's no rapid eye movement, it's stage R. And then, of course, EPIC-63 would be that definite stage R. So you've got low amplitude mixed frequency, no alpha, a rapid eye movement, and low chin EMG. Another way of thinking about this is something called the look back rule. Basically, what it's saying is that stage R rules trump non-REM rules. And so in the absence of non-REM or N1, 2, or 3 defining features, you look at a definite epic of stage R and then look back, look backwards in time until you see something that would not allow you to call it stage R. So you've got a clear epic of REM here. You look back and you say, oh, nothing that I can use to say that it's N1 or N2, and so by default, it's stage R, and I look back another epic, and then I say, oh, slow eye movement, okay, uh, that's N1. So you can see here, this is the epic really to pay attention to. Stage R always trumps N2. If there's a conflict between N2 and stage R, stage R rule takes precedence. And this is another way of looking at it. So these sample epics 60 through 64. We have a K complex in the first half of epic 60 and a K complex in the second half of epic 61. So everything between these two K complexes is N2, which means that epic 60 and 61 are both N2. Then you have here, in EPIC 64, definite stage R, low amplitude mixed frequency, rapid eye movement, low chin EMG, no slow eye movements, no alpha, and so this is stage R. And then you use your look back rule. EPIC 63, no rapid eye movements, but nothing that would say that it's N2, so it's stage R. And then in EPIC 62, same thing. So you look backwards, and all of these three epics are stage R. And so here we can see uh, an example of definite stage R. These are rapid eye movements defined by the initial deflection lasting less than half a second. And... If you want to measure it, you can use the measuring tool here. Low chin EMG, you can see there's these little twitches, which is okay, but the majority of the epic has low chin EMG. Low amplitude mixed frequency EEG, 
And so this is stage R. So then we look backwards. We see these are some slower eye movements, but also some faster eye movements. Low chin EMG, low amplitude mixed frequency. So this is still stage R. Again here, look backwards, this is still stage R. Look backwards, still stage R. Still stage R. And we look backwards until you see the chin come up here. And this is where the transition from N1 to stage R occurs. Here's another example. Epic 34, we have definite stage R, low amplitude mixed frequency, low chin tone, clear rapid eye movements. And then we look forward, still low chin tone. These are tiny little eye movements. But then in Epic 36, no eye movements at all. And this is called the REM continuity rule, where basically you continue scoring it as REM until you have some reason to bring the patient out of REM. Here, we have the majority of the epic is REM, and then you have an arousal in the second half of the epic, and so therefore the next epic, 38, is wake. And so here, this is a bit of what I was talking about. You can end stage R with any of the following. Increase in chin EMG and criteria for N1. Here we have patient in REM, EPIC 70. And then EPIC 71, we have the chin tone increase for the majority of the EPIC, a K-complex in the second half of the EPIC. And so because the K-complex is in the second half of the EPIC, it's N1. But the next epic is N2. Chin tone remains elevated for this N2. And then in the next epic, you have a rapid eye movement, and so it returns back to stage R. And again, these are all examples from the scoring manual, so I would encourage you to take a look at that. It, it does bear reading a few different times for you to kind of get the, uh, the idea of what uh, of what the rules actually mean in, in practice. Here we have low amplitude mixed frequency, rapid eye movement, so clear stage R. Next epic, REM continuity rule. You have no rapid eye movements, but the chin tone remains low, low amplitude mixed frequency. Next epic, the chin is up for the majority of the epic. This little gray line here that's hard to see is the midpoint of the epic. And what this is trying to show you is the EMG is increased for more than half the epic. And then we have a K-complex in the first half of the next epic. So it takes it from N1 to N2. This just describes what arousals do during REM. So here we have rapid eye movement, clear, definite stage R. Next epic, we have an arousal and the chin EMG does go up for less than half the epic, but an arousal alone is not sufficient to end the stage R because there are no slow eye movements. So you can see that all things considered, the score manual rules are really designed to keep a patient in REM unless there's a really good reason to transition them to a different stage. Here with the K-complex and the increased EMG, that is enough to go to N2. This describes what you do with a major body movement that just sort of looks like a, an earthquake during a uh, recording. Even with all of that, the major body movement alone is not sufficient to end stage R. But if it's followed by a slow eye movement, then it does change to N1. So the slow eye movements are pretty critical, and you may want to measure them to see if it's greater or less than half a second. And then just the last example of when to, when to end stage R, you have a rapid eye movement here in EPIC 50, definite stage R, REM continuity rule, EPIC 51, K-complex in the first half of EPIC 52. 
that alone is enough to change it to N2. And then here, we have the scoring of epics with features of N2 as well as REMS. 1K complex alone in the second half of the epic is not enough to transition to N2. And because there's no an additional K complex, all of this remains stage R, meaning that the period between this ra rapid eye movement and this rapid eye movement are all stage R. If there was a second K complex here, here, or really anywhere between this first K complex and the second REM, then you would state then you would change it to N2. So sometimes you've got to be really careful to look out for K complexes or especially spindles, because they can they can be tough to pick out. And this is what that looks like. So rapid eye movement, first K complex second K complex, and then the period between these two K complexes is N2. We have a rapid eye movement here, and then we use the look back rule, and that's why this is R and this is R. I want to talk a little about the arousal rule. It's an abrupt shift of EEG frequency, including alpha, theta, and or frequencies greater than 16 hertz, but not spindles, that last at least three seconds, with at least 10 seconds of stable sleep preceding the change. An arousal during REM requires a concurrent increase in EMG lasting at least a second, and there must be 10 seconds of preceding sleep that may occur during the previous epic, even if that epic was scored as stage W. And again, I just want to make sure that we're all, uh, we're all tracking. If you've got any questions at all, uh, if you go to your, uh, the, in the Zoom program, there's a Q&A. Uh, feel free to click on that, uh, ask uh, any questions if you'd like. Uh, I'm not sure if it's a, if you all just don't have any questions or if you've fallen asleep, um, but I, I didn't see any, and I just want to make sure that I'm not missing uh, any questions at all. So please feel free to ask any questions uh, at any time because I want to make sure that we're not either going too quickly or too slowly. All right. So I just want to show this arousal once more. Again, an arousal in stage R requires an abrupt shift in EEG frequency. So you can see the first half of the epic this low amplitude mixed frequency, meaning that the amplitude of the waveforms are not incredibly high, and that sometimes it's slower, sometimes it's faster. And then we have an increase in the submental, the chin, EMG, lasting greater than a second, with a concurrent sustained increase in frequency. That's what's required in order to score an arousal in stage R. And then finally, I've got about 10 minutes left. Uh, I just wanted to talk a little about limb movements. So we spent a lot of time looking at EEG. We'll talk a little about limb movements and then we'll, we'll briefly review respiratory events. I expect that you'll get a lot of practice with respiratory events, uh, particularly as you're reviewing the studies for sleep disordered breathing. That's why I wanted to focus mainly on the EEG component uh, as you're getting started here. Uh, but limb movements are another area that we look for in the lab. The definition of a significant limb movement, this is again all good uh, board uh, fodder, so make sure that you memorize these numbers. It must last at least half a second. It cannot last any longer than 10 seconds. There must be at least an eight microvolt increase in the EMG voltage. And then the definition of a PLM series, so this is one limb movement, but a PLM series, a periodic limb movement series, there must be a minimum of four limb movements. Each limb movement must last at least five seconds apart. 
from onset to onset. So the start of a limb movement to the start of the next limb movement must be greater than five seconds and less than 90 seconds between limb movements. And I'll show a picture of that in a little bit. When PLMs occur within a 10 second interval and each is associated with an arousal, both limb movements are counted, but only the first arousal should be scored. And that's because you must have at least 10 seconds of stable sleep between arousals. And this is how you measure limb movements. This is the left anterior tibialis. This is the right anterior tibialis. The period length is from the start of the first limb movement to the start of the second limb movement. Not the distance from the offset of the first limb movement to the onset of the next limb movement. It's from onset to onset. And it must be greater than five seconds in order for them to be considered separate limb movements. In this example here in figure six on page 52, we have four seconds from the left to the right limb movement. And as a result, because it's less than five seconds, these two limb movements are considered the same, so one. So even though there's two distinct boxes here, you consider these one limb movement. Now the period length from this limb movement to this limb movement, as long as it's less than 90 seconds, would allow you to score it in a PLM series. Now, an arousal and a limb movement should be considered associated with each other if they occur simultaneously, if they overlap, or if there's less than half a second between the end of one event and the onset of the other, regardless of which one is first. And then, again, just some things to memorize. The end of a limb movement is defined as the start of a period lasting at least half a second, during which the EMG does not exceed two microvolts above the resting EMG. So to go back, you start a limb movement when there is at least eight microvolt increase in EMG voltage for at least half a second. And then you terminate when the EMG does not exceed two microvolts above the resting EMG. Basically when it goes back down to the baseline before you started scoring it. Now, limb movements shouldn't be scored if they occur within half a second of a sleep disordered breathing event, whether it's an apnea, hypopnea, rera. So within half a second preceding to half a second following the event, you do not score limb movement there. So we got a question, excellent. <laughs> All right, uh, so, uh, the question was, on most EMGs, we cannot assess the eight microvolt increase in EMG to score a leg movement. That is a great point. So let us show you what that looks like for the ISR. Now, uh, this is a, an epic of wake, so you wouldn't score limb movement here. I'm just showing this because uh, out of convenience. Uh, just want to show you these little red lines here. This is eight microvolts from the resting EMG to this line. And so if it exceeds that, then you can start scoring the limb movement. Now, strictly speaking, the delta between this eight microvolt line and this eight microvolt line is actually 16. Uh, but I think the user pointed out that it's really hard when we get into such small measurements and the baseline is never inconsequential so there's always a few microvolts of baseline and so we just put this 8 microvolt to 8 microvolt delta or 16 microvolt delta in here to accommodate for the fact that the resting EMG is never zero 
And so some of this is a little bit arbitrary, uh, but you do, you can see that clearly there is a spike in the EMG activity that comes back down to the baseline. Uh, and if your software uh, doesn't show that, um, there may be a measurement tool you can use, uh, or you can just gather some sample epics and print them out so you can kind of see what the, uh, uh, what an average uh, limb movement would look like uh, using your interface. But it can be hard uh, if you're trying to go strictly by the measuring tool if, if your software doesn't uh, accommodate for that. Uh, so another question, uh, if in REM, will an arousal associated with at least one second of elevated chin tone change the epic to N1? So that's a great question. So here we have basically the, the graphic that describes that. If you have an arousal, and an elevation in the chin EMG for at least a second, followed by a slow eye movement, you change it to N1. The arousal alone is not sufficient to, stay, to end stage R. But if you have an arousal followed by a slow eye movement, then it does change it to N1. So hopefully that, that answered the question. Okay. So just wanted to go back to limb movements for a sec and talk about how the limb movements are scored. This is the left anterior tibialis. This is right anterior tibialis. Here we've got these periodic limb movements. And you must have four limb movements in order to call it a PLM series. And for the ISR, you don't score the limb movements unless it's a PLM series. That's important to note because sometimes for your software, you'll just score the limb movements if they meet criteria and the software will figure it out for you. For the ISR, when you're doing it, don't score the limb movements unless it's part of a four limb movement series. And here we have 30 second epics. So this is 120 seconds total. Stage N2, N2, wake, N1. Two limb movements in this epic, a third limb movement in this epic. Here, because it's stage W, we don't score this limb movement, but it's 55 seconds between onset and onset of the fourth limb movement, and this epic is N1, and so one, two, three, four, all of those four are scored, even though this limb movement doesn't count because there's a stage wake uh, in the midst of these two sleep stages. And then a couple minutes left. Uh, as you can see, we, we left three minutes for respiratory, and that was by design, because I know you'll get a whole lot of respiratory in your labs. Uh, just a couple things to remember. We've got uh, apneas and hypopneas. We've got central and obstructive, you'll learn all about those. Important things to note for scoring though, the event duration is measured from the nadir preceding the first breath that's clearly reduced to the beginning of the first breath that approximates baseline breathing amplitude. And that's critical because sometimes events will be close to 10 seconds or they may span epics, and we're not sure. In, in the ISR, you score respiratory events in every epic in which they appear. So even though there's only a tiny bit of this respiratory event in epic 50, for the ISR, you would score a respiratory event in epic 50 and 51. And then just note that the apnea requires both a drop in the peak signal excursion by greater than or equal to 90% using an oronasal thermal sensor, alternative apnea sensor, or a PAP device flow. 
and that the duration of the reduced flow is greater than or equal to 10 seconds. So I think we have just about one more minute. If there are any other questions, please uh, feel free to enter them now. Uh, otherwise, you can always reach us at isrgoldstandard at aasm.org. Feel free to reach out at any time if there are any questions whatsoever. Uh, we love going over you know, different uh, examples, answering nuances. Sometimes the scoring rules seem like they're a bit uh, either arbitrary or conflicting, and we can help deconflict some of that. Uh, but welcome to uh, Sleep Medicine, and I uh, hope you all have a, a fantastic year and that you learn a lot. And uh, we'll continue the, uh, the webinar. Uh, next month and sorry we just saw there's a couple more questions uh, I'll try to answer them quickly uh, 1k in REM doesn't convert it to N2 but to do right yes 2k complexes uh, would convert it to N2 and bet the period between the 2k complexes would certainly uh, change it to N2 and then anything you'd like to say about the number of epics for RBD, that may be a different talk because that could take a little while. So again, thanks very much for all the interest and uh, we'll look forward to, to speaking with you soon.